now. <laughs> Have I lost it? Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> Well, for some reason, the month of August always gets me thinking about a new year. I know it sounds sort of strange. I suppose with the kids going back to school and football starting to come on the television and Halloween and Thanksgiving decorations already being in stores, my mind starts to go to all those things that need to happen before the end of one year and the beginning of a new one. This year, though, more so than usual. I think I've been thinking a great deal about the year 2020. I suspect mostly because of the milestones my family will mark in the coming year. Like the fact that Marion and I will celebrate 15 years of marriage together. And I'll observe the 15th anniversary of my ordination into the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. But the one that gets me the most, or at least the one I think about most often, is the fact that I'll be turning the big four zero which I probably wouldn't be all that worried about, except that when discussing it with Marion, I'll say something like, man, I, I can't believe I'm going to be 40 next year. And thinking she might say something like, oh, it's no big deal, or it's just another day on the calendar. Instead, she says things like, oh, yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> or, I know, I've been worried about you, too. <laughs> And while I'm not there yet, I'm starting to get a glimpse of, of what she means. For instance, my body hurts in general just all the time. And I don't recover from anything like I used to. But more than the physical ailments that come with age, it's, it's the existential questions that specifically come with, with turning 40. Like, what have I done with my life up to this point? And how much longer do I really have? And how am I going to prioritize my time during the second half of this life? I know what some of you are thinking. I sense it in the smiles on your faces. Nathan, just you wait. <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Which is true, I realize. And I know age anymore is mostly relative in many ways. Or at least that's what Richard Rohr certainly seems to suggest. He says we do in fact experience two halves to life, although neither half has anything to do with chronology. In his book Falling Upward, he writes that the first half of life is really about the love of self. It's about building the container for our lives. It's concerned with questions like, what will I do for a living, and where will I live, and, and who will come with me? The big concerns of the first half of life are identity and security and sexuality and gender. If you think about it, most individuals, as well as institutions, including the church, mind you, we're all devoted to this first half. It can end whether you're young or whether you're well along in age alike. Because the second half, you see, is about what we will do with what we've built. It's what happens if we ever stop building and become in tune with all that's both inside and outside the structure we've created. It's about befriending neighbors despite our fences. It's about listening to other people's stories despite the soundproof walls we construct to tune people out. It's about being vulnerable enough to come outside our container and to be changed by the world. Recently, I was reading about the debates in Congress regarding the Farm Bill and, and food stamps. Some members of Congress want stricter work requirements for people who receive SNAP payments. One representative cited 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, in which Paul says, When we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. The representative went on to say, I think it's reasonable expectation that we have work requirements. Of course, almost 45% of those who receive food stamps are children who shouldn't be working. And another 30% are elderly or folks with disabilities who may not be able to work. 
Then there are the many who are working but don't make enough to feed themselves or their families. I got to wondering if Congress had talked to anybody who's actually on food stamps. Although I shouldn't be surprised. After all, we all struggle to get to the second half of life because it's easier to live in echo chambers and vacuums than to be in conversation with the world. The point is, while the first half of life is about us, the second half is about recognizing we're part of something bigger than ourselves. While in the first half we find our identity in that which we accumulate, in the second we discover who we are through our relationship with others. And while there's nothing wrong with the first half, in fact, in many ways it's essential, the risk is that we build up so much security for ourselves that we, that we lock ourselves in, unable to get to that second half, even if we wanted to. In a previous congregation I served, I remember doing a funeral for a man who lived to be 75 years old. He worked up until the day he died. As a farmer, he had virtually the same routine day in and day out. He rarely, if ever, took a vacation. In fact, he grew up and died on the same farmland generations of his family had farmed. I can recall sitting by his bedside as the family surrounded him, hospice in the next room. He didn't have the energy to say much, so he used his words sparingly, which I think is the reason I remember them so poignantly. He looked to his wife of 50 years and said, I should have bought you more jewelry. I shouldn't have been so worried about saving every penny we had. And I should have spent every dime showing you how much I love you. He's not alone, of course. I hear it all the time. I should have spent more time with my kids. I should have spent more time traveling and seeing the world. I should have spent less time worrying about stuff that doesn't matter and more doing the things that really do matter. Which is what our reading from Luke's Gospel today seems to address. A man obviously living the first half of his life comes demanding of Jesus that this, brother's, that this man's brother divide the family inheritance. After all, those are the kinds of things we do in the first half. We make black and white demands of one another, of the world, even of God, all in an effort and self-interest. And so in response, Jesus tells a parable about someone else only concerned with living their first half. Just listen to how many times in this parable he refers to himself. What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. That's the thing about the first half of life. It's all about our barns, our houses, our cars, our opinions, our family, our friends. We very neatly and orderly construct our own proverbial small worlds in which we are at the center because, well, it's just easier that way. It keeps things clean and simple. We don't want things to get messy. had another congregant who started a ministry at the local jail, the community we served. He heard there was a need for someone to teach Bible study, so he thought to himself, well, well, I could do that. I could bring my Bible and teach them what I've come to believe about, about my God. And so he did, for several months, in fact. But one day he came in and sat down in my office, and he said, this is a lot harder than I thought. 
these men, their stories, their lives, their sufferings. They're changing me. I think I started this Bible study for myself. But now I go because I care about them. And that's the shift from the first to the second half, isn't it? Moving beyond the well-constructed worlds we live in order to be changed by God's world? Of course, Jesus says it like this elsewhere in the Gospels. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life because of me will find it. Which is easier said than done, I realize. After all, this is not the message the world reinforces. I was reminded of this just the other day. My son Harrison is really into music these days. And so frequently he wants me to hear his new favorite song. We'll be in the kitchen and he'll say, Dad, have you, have you heard such and such by, by so and so? And once again, I'm reminded of my age when I respond, well, what kind of band has a name like that? <laughs> he'll proceed to say, hey Alexa, and of course play the song for me. A few weeks ago, though, I achieved the impossible and actually introduced a song to him before he'd heard it. I suspect many of you have heard it by now. It's been out for a while. It's called Beautiful by Ed Sheeran. The lyrics go like this. This is my only fear, that we become beautiful people. Drop top designer clothes, front row at fashion shows. What you know and who you know inside the world of beautiful people. Champagne and rolled up notes, prenups and broken homes, surrounded but still alone. That's not who we are. We are not beautiful. I remember the first time he heard it, he, he said to me, wait, I, I, I don't get it. What, what's that song mean? Truth be told, I remember having to listen to it a couple of times myself to be sure I was hearing what I thought I was hearing. And I realized it's because the message of the song doesn't align with what we experience in the world. After all, what we tend to understand is beauty is what we see on the surface, what we look like, what we have, who we know, you know, those bigger barns. Those are the things that are important. We spend all our time attempting to build a so-called beautiful life. And in so doing, miss the beauty of the things like deep friendship and, and true community and the experience of truly loving our neighbor as ourselves. And if you don't believe me, all you need to do is listen to the conversation we're having. I overheard it again just this last week, among well-meaning people of faith, mind you. What's the problem? What, what are you so upset about? Oh, I don't know, children being separated from their families at the border? The transgendered marginalized by public policy and law? A broken health care system that politicians refuse to fix? An ongoing gun violence epidemic? To which the person responded, But what about the economy? The economy's doing great. No one complains about that. Take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. For your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So how do we get there? How do we live into the second half of life that Jesus essentially describes and lives throughout his ministry? Well, that's what this series is all about. And it's not easy. In fact, I can guarantee you we will end up in a hot mess along the way. They'll be suffering. They'll be questioning. They'll be doubting for sure. I'm not going to lie, you may not want to go. 
I'm unsure, I'm all that certain that I want to get there myself. But if you're looking for a purpose beyond tearing down your barns to build bigger ones, well then this series is for you. Which I suspect you are. Because you're here. Desperately like me, trying to figure out how to follow Jesus more faithfully. So come on. We better get started. After all, our lives are being demanded of us today.